come on up. We've got this box of leaves here. And I'm gonna invite you, as this box of leaves goes around, to take a look at them and grab one. Maybe not just the first one you see, think about it for a minute. Maybe there's a leaf that grabs your eye. What this leaf is meant to represent is you today, uh, in a way. Um, if that doesn't hold sway for you, I'd encourage you to just grab one anyway. It's going to mean something at the end. You should know God loves you right where you are. Sometimes it's hard to articulate how we're feeling in a day. May this leaf represent how you're feeling. If you're feeling like you're having a rough week, maybe you choose a leaf that's got a couple dark spots on it or cracks. or it's, Maybe you're feeling like, I wish I was at home on my own. You choose one that's all curled up in on yourself. Maybe you are really pushing through to make sure that everything looks okay in your life and you choose a leaf that's still green because those leaves are really fighting to keep going even though the seasons are changing. In this season where things are changing, what's God calling you to? What might God be inviting you to? Let's consider that through these leaves. If you're watching from home, I encourage you to press pause and go outside and grab a leaf. Pray and invite God to speak to you through this time. Who does God see you as today? <coughs> we have a lot of names for God. Creator. Created each one of us unique, independent, with gifts to share. And we all live different lives. We all have different experiences, different things happen to us that are both in and out of our control. God sees us and sees us as beautiful. And just invite you to ask God the question, what do you see today in me that I can't see? What beauty can you see that I'm unaware of? Think about that just for a second as I grab my notes. Feel the limits of this cord later stopping me. All right. I encourage you to either just hold that leaf or maybe if that's distracting, put it beside you. So who are we? We're Jesus followers, Christians. We, as the Sandbanks Meeting House, are Anabaptists. That's like the denomination that we belong to. And right here, we want you to know first off that you are loved. You are a beloved creation of the Creator, and God loves you right where you are, as you are, before anything happens, before the sermon is preached, before you walk out the door in the morning, before you leave today, if you're still at home, you are loved and you belong. That's why we say that all are welcome here and in our communities. So you are loved by God and we wanna work to create an open space where you feel as though you belong. And I hope you do feel as though you belong in community with us. And then lastly, one of the last things as followers of Christ that we are called to is to become like Christ. We think Jesus is at the center. And part of what that means is it means that we are going to work throughout our life once we encounter God to become like Jesus, the Son of God, who came to show us how to live in the world. So you're beloved. You belong here in community. And you are called to become like Christ. I'm going to tell a story today of my life and marriage. And uh, 
it's going to be part of God's story. It is part of God's story because God is interacting in my life each and every day. The Spirit is interacting and calling you to things each and every day. Our story, when we interact with God, becomes part of the story of God and God's people throughout history, which is what the Bible is. We're going to read some of that later, a couple stories from there that are recorded to remind us that God doesn't work independent of people. He doesn't work just in individuals, but through communities, people that are gathered together. And then we're going to invite you, invite each other. We're going to challenge and encourage each other. I'm not going to do it. We're going to do it for each other in community as we're called to. But hear this, your beloved. Often when I get up and give a sermon, I feel like it's always a challenge. Go work harder, do this, add that to your life. And that can be a lot. If you're in a season where it's hard, where you're struggling, know this, God loves you. And he's glad that you're here, if here is all that you can manage today. But today we're going to talk about how we're called to be together. Because it's easy to stay home. COVID taught us that. I was just talking to some people today that moved here to the county, this beautiful place, seeking a church. And then COVID pressed the brakes on that. And they couldn't reach out, get involved, and invested in community. As churches, we had to relearn how can we stay together in times when we can't gather together. We put church online. Some of you are still watching and connecting with us online, and we are so glad that you can. But what does it mean to watch from home when it's so easy to switch the channel when you don't necessarily agree with it or because today you only have 20 minutes instead of 35 minutes for the message to listen? What does it mean to pick and choose those pieces? Is that the togetherness that we were called to? No, that's... That's what society is teaching us, so that we can be at home, be in our own little private bubble, and do it by ourselves. We choose a community. We go there until that guy or girl, that man or woman on the stage, apologies, uh, when they say something that we don't agree with or that hurts us. When they do that, we look to the next community. We go find somewhere else, somewhere that just looks a little bit more like us. Maybe it's just too far to drive. I mean, that's the truth of our parish here. I know people that are in Belleville that might come once a month, but can't come all the time to a building like this. What does it mean to be a community when it's a little too far to drive? But we're called together, so why should we be together? Well, my story today is uh, a story that happened when I had turned uh, 29. I was planting a church with a bunch of leaders. Launching would be uh, a better word. Launching a meeting house site in Richmond Hill uh, with a lot of my friends. And we were having a party. Um, and at this party, one of our friends, they had brought their two-year-old. and. I was down there on the floor playing games and invested uh, with the two-year-old. Nobody else really was. I was. Me, the 29-year-old uh, single guy. I just love hanging out with kids. I love hanging out with my own kids now. But when I was 29, that was like, that was 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, I didn't have kids then. And there was no, I wasn't dating anybody. And I wasn't sure, am I ever going to be dating uh, anybody, am I ever going to get married or have kids on my own? I kind of reached the point in my life where I thought this season has passed for me. And so I would invest in other people's families. And that's how I would have family. But these people, they heard my passion. They saw my passion for kids. They heard my heart for family, for wanting to have a family of my own. It's something I'd wanted since I was three. Uh, I was going to have a huge family. Of course, at that time, I was going to live uh, out back at the tree in the middle of the farm. Uh, we're in a farming community here, so I'm sure many of you are aware of where those trees are in the back field. Because my mom was going to be, obviously, the best babysitter around for my kids. So 
And I like the idea of kids, but possibly without some of the work that I'm finding out is the reality of children. <laughs> so they were listening to me, and uh, they connected me with Whitney. And I mean, the rest is kind of history. Whitney and I had the same kind of goals. She, from a small age, would drag around, from the age of three, she was dragging around a life-size baby, a doll <laughs> called Tyler, that she still has, that now our kids drag around. So we were connected by our friends. And in that season, you know, we would share uh, with our friends the excitement of falling in love, and they would get excited with us. They would get caught up in our love. You see, we were not made to be alone. In Genesis, uh, God was living in community, hovering over the water. And from community, God lovingly created the universe, everything. And it was good. But to be complete, God created us to live in relationship, first with him, but then that wasn't even enough. God made humanity, Adam and Eve, together to complement each other because humans are not solo creatures. We need to do life together. We're created to live in community, community with God in partnership, community with others partnered together with God to steward creation the way we were intended to. So other friends of mine have been married now uh, 23 years. And uh, I remember when I was working with them in a church years ago, I just admired their relationship so much. It didn't, it wasn't obvious to me what was happening, what made their relationship so real. But I asked them one day in a car when they'd been married for only six years at the time. It seemed like a lot then. And I remember what Ben said. The reason our marriage is fresh the reason that we can look at each other and be the way that we are is because I wake up every single morning and I choose to love my wife. It wasn't a choice that he'd made six years before, 23 years ago now, and then just lived his life based on that one choice. It was a choice that he made every single day. And it stuck with me. Every day is a choice. In my marriage with Whitney, I have to choose to love her. In my relationship with God, I have to choose to submit to the Father, to listen, to hear truthfully who I am. A lot of the time, that truthful hearing is that I'm more beautiful and more loved than I think. Maybe that's your story, too. We have to choose. Will we submit or will we go our own way? The only way that Whitney and I were able to share and move together and submit to each other was by sharing in community. We shared in those early years with our friends, the same friends that brought us together. We shared about the hardships that we were encountering, the things that we didn't know were going to happen once we got married, uh, the fights that we would have. Maybe you've been in, had a long friendship and you were surprised at uh, the, the fights that you could have with a very close friend. Maybe you're married and you didn't know that the biggest fights, the ones that would hurt the most, would be with the person that you love the most. Well, we had friends that could tell us sometimes marriage is like that, but they could also show us how to come back together. They could show us how to submit to each other. We couldn't do it alone. We needed the same friends. You see, marriage is a picture of what we're called to in the church. We have to submit to each other in marriage. I don't get what I want. Whitney doesn't get what I, what she, I don't, I don't know what's happening in my words right there. I hope you get the yin and the yang of what I'm saying, the back and forth there. It's not a back and forth. We have to come together and submit to each other to move together with love. And that's the picture that God, one of the pictures that Jesus gives us of the church. We're called together to be a body, to submit to each other, to submit to God, to enter into that relationship with Jesus. And so we're going to 
turn, you can turn to Romans 15, verses 5 and 6 are going to be up here uh, on the screen, or you can turn on your uh, device, and it reads this. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it talks here about people living in complete harmony with each other. And the word there for that uh, is homothumadon. It's a very big word. It's a Greek word. This is where I show you that I learned Greek when I went to school. Homothumadon. It means being caught up. It's like the excitement of y you just can't help it because your friend is so excited to share their day with you that you, that you get excited. You can feel it. Uh, Whitney and I, we were so excited, you know, with each other that when we would get together, when we were dating, before we would get married, our friends would grow excited about our relationship because our excitement would overflow. Homothumadon, it's like watching a murmuration of birds all moving in one direction, the flock. It seems to move as one body, all these different pieces. It's like the leaves on the street getting caught in the wind by the car. They can't help it. They're pulled along in the direction, all in one direction together. They are caught up, and they are forced to move together through their excitement. Jesus does the only thing possible for us to move together in homothumadon, for us to be together with one purpose and one mind. He brings us back through sacrifice. He shows us in the Garden of Gethsemane what it is to struggle and suffer and then put down your own self to serve. He submits to the Father there, showing us how we, in turn, can submit, how we, in turn, are called to submit. He shows us how to sacrifice for our friends by example, by doing it for us showing us how to be available to pray, to answer prayers for other people, to challenge people when we see them doing things that aren't good for them or for others, to encourage them when we see growth happening, when we see something exciting. It's our job to share our experience of God. God calls us into unity, not like the world does. The world has lines of nations. People connect because they speak the same language. Or maybe they're, they watch the same show, they're Trekkies, or they go to Comic-Con, or uh, people could identify because of their profession, their lawyers or doctors. No. God calls us into unity to be a kingdom under one king, sacrificing together for the good of all, setting down our differences and bringing our gifts. Your gifts, all those leaves together on the tree, We're called to build the church with these mosaic, the mosaic of leaves. In Revelation, we read that the leaves are for the healing of the nation. It's our job. Our job is to be that healing with the leaves, the gifts that God gave us. We're going to turn to Hebrews uh, chapter 10, and I want to look at that passage for a moment, chapter, verses 19 to 25. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood. 
to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Hebrews 10, 19, and 25. So what is it talking about in here, this Hebrews passage? It starts off and it says that we're all able to go in now before God. Well, what's that about? Well, before Jesus' sacrifice, only one person could go in to the holiest place, which was where the Ark of the Covenant was in the temple. It was behind a curtain, and that was the place where God's spirit, his presence, was believed to reside. And the priest, the high priest, was only able, allowed to go in there one time a year, and only after going through a very specific set of ritual cleanings and sacrifices and confessions themselves. They would go to be before God for the, all people, the whole nation. But before they went in, one of the things that they had to do was they had to tie a rope around their waist. It was a rope that the other priests would hold the end of because when the high priest went in to this space, heaven forbid he hadn't prepared correctly or, or if he just would drop dead of a heart attack in that space, like no one's allowed to go in there. How do we get this guy back out if something were to happen? So they would tie a rope on him because nobody was allowed to go in there. It's how serious it was. But now Jesus says, all can come before God because of that sacrifice. The curtain was separating us. Now it's gone. Jesus made the whole sacrifice so that we could join in in the regenerative kingdom work, encouraging the God that we see in others. When we see the Spirit move, when we see the Spirit challenge, and when we see that God image in others, we can lift it up and encourage others when we see them. We can challenge people. We can remind them that isn't exactly how we do things in community when we see them hurt each other. But we do that not by shaming them, but by showing them how we do it, how we live life together by example. If you're new to our community, and if you haven't been part of a home church, I encourage you to find a group of Christian friends, even one Christian, that you can talk to about your walk with Jesus. Somebody who can tell you and share about their relationship with God so that you can grow together. Um, I, I'd be happy if you aren't even local to us to help you find a church community where you are, somewhere where you can connect in. For those that already do follow Jesus, are you in or are you trying to worship Jesus on your own? Maybe you're listening to podcasts. Maybe you're, you know, watching throughout the week. Maybe you're reading your scripture. You're, you're praying, but you're not connecting with a bigger community. Our theology says that we need to connect into the bigger community. We believe that God's spirit is speaking to each person. And it's not when we all sit and turn and face the same direction that we hear God's voice, but it's when we turn and face each other that we can more fully hear the Spirit speaking. And so I'd encourage you to get in. If you aren't in, what's keeping you from joining? Maybe, you know, you've been hurt in a group before. Maybe you went and the experience wasn't what you thought it was going to be. Uh, for us, uh, I mean, we have a wide geography that we cover. Trenton, I said, to Kingston. And we just have six groups, four that are meeting in person and two that are meeting online. Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Maybe those times don't work for you and they don't fit. I would love it. Let me know. I'd love to find out what is keeping you from being connected with other Christians, from challenging them, and from allowing them to speak into your life as well. Maybe you're afraid to participate because secretly you think you're not good enough. 
you just think, I, I'm not sure I've done something in my past that excludes me from being able to speak into other people's lives, I'd encourage you, no matter what stage of the journey you're in, you could, be, could have been walking with God for your whole life, 40, 40, 50, who knows how many years. You could have met Jesus yesterday. All of these voices matter at the table. No matter where you are in your faith, you have something to share. Remember this. Your walk with God is personal. Look at those leaves. You're all individuals. And the way that you've met God, the way that God has interacted in your life, answered prayers, encountered, and put people in your life is unique to you. Your experiences are unique. But they're not private. You cannot live Christianity in a bubble. You need to bring your experiences in and share them with us. You need to remember th this because um, you need to be available to sacrifice, to show others how to be there for others, how to be available to pray. Hmm? This is what happens when you lose your spot. Our stories are part of God's larger story of love, and they need to be told. Some people are going to encounter Jesus for the first time through you, through your service, volunteering with whatever group it is that you've been called to. Some people are going to encounter an, a new image for God because of the way God has met you. And some people are going to be challenged to take their next step to become like Christ because of the things that God has challenged you to do in your life. And that's why, like, this is my favorite photo uh, from our wedding. The photographer sneakily came up behind Whitney and I and took this picture that shows us all these people that... Um, you know, were there to support us. All those people that we were reaching out and sharing excitement with. These were also all the same people who could reach out to us and remind us of that excitement over the next couple of years when we got into some of those really juicy fights. But they're also the people that now can look at us 10 years later and can say, you guys, like, we thought you were in love when you got married, but your relationship is so much deeper, so much richer than it was now, because they can see what has happened over the course of those years, that time. Sometimes you can't see it by yourself, and that's what the body is here for. You know, this past weekend, week, I was at a pastor's retreat for a denomination, and we were singing the song, uh, this song, and the, the line went that, that God is turning seas into highways. And it's a reference to God opening the Red Sea for the Israelite nation to pass through. That was a miracle that didn't happen for one person. It happened for a nation. Maybe your miracle needs to happen in the body. It can't happen until you come. Maybe your miracle is going to be answered by the body or your prayer. You need to be here with us. Adam and Eve, humanity, were created in a garden, but we chose our own selfish path, our understanding, our serving, our own way, chose individuality. It's what it looks like today, anyway. Jesus came in a garden to show us a different path. He said, you can't do it selfishly, you have to sacrifice. He showed us how that suffering was. He showed us it's even okay to wrestle, wrestle with God. Those were deep prayers. And in Revelation, we read of a city filled with gardens because we are called to participate in this mission that God has in the recreation of all things. We're called to get to work and to design new gardens with God right where we are so that we can all meet together in harmony and homothumadon, called together, worshiping, caught up in unison together where we can't help but doing it, speaking as one voice. The challenge this week is to get into home church if you're not in one. If you are in home church, you need to look around. Who isn't in home church? 
Who isn't in a group of Christians that are there to encourage them, to challenge them, to support them when they need it? Is God inviting you to reach out to those people? If you aren't in a group, I want to talk to you because I want to know what can I do to help support you in taking your next step towards Christ? But also, what's keeping you from community and what would help you to get in so that we can journey together, so that we can all get caught up with excitement in one voice? Let's get in together. Don't be afraid. You know, it's that piece where we think that uh, we're not good enough or maybe we don't have anything to share or we might screw it up if we come. The only reason that we have a copy of this book to read is because they weren't necessarily doing it right. Because God did have to intervene and God wanted to intervene. We can partner with God and do great works, things even greater than we could do by ourselves. Let's do it. The church isn't perfect. Let's work with God despite of our imperfections and invite God to move through us. Are you willing to bring your gifts into community? What is it in that little leaf? I'm going to pray um, here, but then we just have a few minutes. We don't have to get the kids right away, uh, but I'd encourage you. What's one thing, a gift that you received in community? Are you brave enough? Do you have something that you can share? And two, is there something that you feel that maybe God's given you to give to others? I'd encourage you to share those with one or two people after we're done. Let's just pray. Creator, we are so grateful for you for coming and being an example through Jesus for not leaving us when we got it wrong, but for coming, for coming and showing us. And we give thanks for your spirit, which is here guiding us and moving in between us right now. Help us to see how our story is part of your big, big story, God. And give us the courage to tell our peace and to lift others up. We pray this in your Son, Jesus' name, and by the power of this Holy Spirit. Amen. So I encourage you, where have you received a gift in the community? And what gift do you think you have to share? Would you be brave enough to share those two things? We've got a minute to, to share that, and then Casey's going to come up, and uh, we're going to have, <coughs> have a song in five minutes. So we're going to close with worship. We've got five minutes to chat. So I know it's 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 fun. You can do different things when you're in person. If you're at home, I want you to type in the chat. <laughs>